We are on week 10 of uh, our uh, lesson here. Uh, this lesson happens to be what we call the, the Christian Mindset. The church sign of the week. Uh, this is probably for me here. Uh, the sermon topic will be, what is hell? And then it says, come early and hear our choir sing. So, so that choir is for me, I guess. Okay. Uh, once again, uh, like, we, like we said, uh, hopefully uh, something gets passed along here that uh, we don't know about before. Okay, so in order, uh, in order to set the proper context for the Christian mindset, it's, once again, it's important to have the foundation of those first three verses to be of the same mind. In Philippians 4, 1, Therefore, my brethren, dearly beloved, and long for my joy and crown, so stand fast in the Lord, my dearly beloved. I beseech you, Adias, and I beseech Syntyche, that they be of the same mind in the Lord, and entreat thee also, true yoke fellow. Help those women which labored with me in the gospel, with Clement also, and with my other fellow laborers, whose names are in the book of life. So those highlight uh, Paul's brotherly love, the conflict between uh, two church members, and then Paul uh, uh, setting the foundation for what our lessons are now, teaching about what the Christian mindset is, and he asks everybody in that assembly to help those women. So as an assembly, we're responsible for edifying and, and uh, uh, comforting each other and to help in disputes and stuff. Okay, now into our lesson, the Christian mindset, uh, four through seven. Rejoice in the Lord always, and again I say rejoice. Let your moderation be known unto all men that the Lord is at hand. Be careful for nothing, but in everything, by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your request be known, uh, be made known unto God. And the peace of God, which passes all understanding, shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. And in these lessons, we're trying to get from being anxious, uh, anxious cautious, concerned, worried all the time to having the peace of God and having the ability to take advantage of that peace of God. Okay, we in four, verse four, rejoice in the Lord. We covered, we, we covered what rejoicing is. Uh, we talked about uh, being in the Lord, and we talked about how it's just not a part-time thing, that we need to set our minds on, on, a, on the positivity of what our blessings of salvation are. And we're supposed to be doing that all the time. But because of the flesh, that makes it impossible. But what should we be, what should we be striving for? That we're always rejoicing. So it's a, it's a good thing that uh, when you start to feel down and stuff, is to think of this verse, find, uh, uh, remember where you're supposed to be mentally and kind of make it a safeguard or a stop, a stop gap to kind of not let you get down that deep. Verse five, let your moderation be known unto all men, the Lord is at hand. We talked about moderation. Moderation is the calmness of mind, evenness of mind, calm of temper. We don't want erratically emotional Christians that are are uh, high one day and depressed the next day. Okay, so what Paul's getting at here is he wants steadiness, right? So we talked about that. Last week we talked about to be, uh, be known, let your moderation be known unto all men. 
and I thought that the scriptures gave a great example uh, because Paul was dealing in Philippi and if the, the people at Philippi witnessed what Paul went through at Philippi when he was in prison and they saw the results of Paul's moder Paul and Silas's moderation be known unto all men where the prisoners had heard the gospel, the prison keeper had heard the gospel, and the prison keeper's household had heard the gospel. And because of that ability that Paul had and God's opportunity that he provided it to him, we see the after effects that the prison keeper and his household were saved and were added to that assembly in Philippi. Now, it finishes up this verse in 5. It says, the Lord is at hand. It says, let your moderation be known unto all men. The Lord is at hand. And this is a little bit of a play of words. We could either take this either way, and either way that we take it would be correct. If we look at the Lord is at hand, uh, Hebrews 13, 5, let your conversation be without covetousness and be content with such things as ye have, for he hath said, I will never leave thee nor forsake thee. So we could take this, when Paul says the Lord is at hand, we could take this that the Lord is present with us at all times. He will never leave us, and he will never forsake us. Okay, so even when you go through some unpleasant experiences, the Lord is at hand. He is by your side. We can certainly take that, uh, the Lord is at hand, like that. The other way that we can take it is 1 Thessalonians 5, 1 and 2. But of the times and seasons, brethren, ye have no need that I write unto you. For yourselves know perfectly that in the day of the Lord so cometh as a thief in the night. We could also take it that the Lord is at hand that the Lord is ready to come back at any time. And when we stop to think, if we stop to think about that, would we do some things that we do, or would we plan to do some things that, that we do that we shouldn't be doing if we know that the Lord could appear instantly? For example, if we knew for certain that the Lord was going to come back at, say, 2 o'clock this afternoon, what would we be doing between now and that time? Right? I'm sure we would not be, do, be doing anything that would displease the Lord. Right? Because... We certainly wouldn't want to be caught within that type of activity. And what Paul, is, uh, what Paul might be saying here is, let your moderation be known unto all men, uh, the Lord is at hand, is think that, that mentally we should always be thinking that the Lord is literally seconds away from appearing. And if we could adopt that mindset, how much would that affect our attitude and affect how we treat people and affect our own personal activity if we knew that the Lord was just seconds away? So uh, it's kind of a play on words, but either way that you take that portion of Scripture would be absolutely correct. The Lord is always by our side. He will never leave us and forsake us. And he could appear physically at any given second. Okay, so that would wrap up verse 5. Now, next two weeks what we'll cover is, is really the meat of this. 
uh, of, of the Christian mindset is verses uh, 6 and 7. But 6 is really the, the nucleus of what this, these lessons are all about. Now, before we go into 6, I'll remind you once again why, would, why we are here in these lessons. We have an argument, a continual battle between two Christians within this assembly. Okay? And it's because of that that Paul is now asking for help, seeing that he's in Rome, he's not in Philippi. He's asking all the members of the Philippian church to help out with this problem. And he's also now teaching and laying the, uh, the groundwork of how to help those women. Okay? It says, be careful for nothing, but in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your request be made known unto God. And we'll start off here, be careful for nothing. The key word here would be careful. We, at least I could say, when I read be careful, I take that as, you know, be cautious, kind of be on the lookout or whatever. But when you, when you dive into the Word of God and you dig into these words, here's the definition of careful. Full of care, anxious, solicitous. What does anxious mean? Greatly concerned or solicitous. Respecting something future or unknown. Being in painful suspense. Greatly concerned. Paul is, is saying, be greatly concerned for nothing. All right, he goes on. We'll get that definition in a second. Respecting something future or unknown. We get ourselves in a frenzy. I get myself in a frenzy of what could possibly happen in a bad situation. You know, you get yourself into a situation that's not good. Probably the biggest fear that you have is the unknown results, right? So, and I can't speak for you, but in my flesh, those unknown results are never on the positive side. They're always the worst thing that could possibly happen, right? So, uh, so if you get yourself in, in a situation and you're now thinking what is the worst possible outcome and that's going to happen to, to me. Being in painful suspense and when you're in that mindset, right, it, it just continues. You're, it, you're being in a painful suspense. You're suspended into that anxiety. And when you're suspended within that anxiety, <clears throat> you obviously you become very errorable. And I, I, know, I know I can speak uh, on my behalf or whatever, what happens when somebody knows that you have a problem that you have to deal with and your mind is automatically going to the worst results that could happen and you're going through that? There's two ways that you could re uh, react to somebody, to another brother trying to help you with that situation, right? One is what I see commonly all the time, uh, not all the time, but most frequently is you can't help me with my problem. And there's always an excuse why. Because we want to voluntarily stay in that suspenseful state. We it's kind of like, like a self-inflicted punishment. We want to stay there. We don't want anybody to come up with a solution, 
Why is that? People don't want to change. Like they, that's a that's one of Satan's effects is to get a Christian into that mindset that they can't be helped. Pastor uh, uh, has has mentioned this a couple of times that people have approached him and they they they, they fall into some deep sin and they feel that they can't be forgiven that. Right? And when you take a step back, who is really behind that negative influence? So we, we see here that we have to renew our mind, as Paul talks about in uh, chapter uh, 12 of Romans. If, if we have the proper Christian mindset, then we... Going along with uh, chapter 6 of Ephesians, you have that wall of defense of what Satan can influence you on. Because like these two women here, these two women are battling and arguing. They're on the negative side of a mindset. And, and what was the phrasing that Paul used about their help in the gospel? It was past tense. They helped them in the gospel. But in that state that those two women are now in Philippians 4, 2, are they helping Paul in the gospel? No. Satan has successfully and completely taken those two people out of the battle. And they're off to the side. And, and we'll kind of talk a little bit more about the anxiety and suspense that those two women are struggling with. And Paul's response to that was, was to ask other people to help those women. So it's, it's kind of like, you know, it's like a marriage or whatever. If your spouse gets down, what do you do to uplift that spouse? Yeah, you try to encourage them. Uh, you try to be extra nice to them. You try, you know, honey, what's wrong? And in other words, you're trying to help. Now, in some relationships, when somebody is down, I've seen the spouse take advantage of that and kind of drive it with a sledgehammer and get that thing down even further. What are you looking at? <laughs> okay, so there's two there's two ways that you can do that. Same thing uh, with an assembly and a believer that's going through some struggles. Okay, the last thing that you want to be in an assembly with somebody that's going through some struggles is yet another problem. Okay, and this is you know what Paul is is trying to. Uh, to, to teach here, it's it's he's basically telling not only uh, 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 you would die as in Sintish, but he's also uh, telling all those other yoke fellows. It says, "Be careful for nothing. Don't be anxious and worried." Okay, we see that that either you would die as or Sintish or both are full of high anxiety and worried that the other person is going to come out on top. They're all worked up in that anxiety. And as that battle goes, it's a one-up, it's a one-up, it's a one-up, and it's a one-up. And that thing inflates until it could possibly get to a point that people take sides and you have a, a church split. And Paul is saying, oh, hold the phone here. Let's reset all this. And let's get our mindset. That's why he's telling them in uh, for, uh, the first three verses is to be of the same mind. Because if you're, in the, if you're at the same mind or you're in the same mind, you're not going to be arguing and stuff. Okay? 
the next, solicitous, careful, anxious, concerned. Okay? So think about what careful means in this verse, right? It says, be careful for what? Nothing. What's nothing? Is that all-inclusive? Kind of, huh? Be careful for nothing. So Paul is, if we were to be careful for nothing, if we could reach that state, that mindset, that if, well, I got the verse in here as well, but if we can cast all our cares upon him, what would we worry about? nothing. And that's what Paul is trying to drive home here. It says, be careful for nothing. In order to get there, you have to really give up the flesh. Because the flesh is what drives all the anxiety, all the depression, all the downness. Right? And Paul is trying to say, be careful for nothing. And as we dig into the layers into this, we'll, we'll see what Paul is trying to drive at with getting the Christian mind to basically overpower the flesh and, and get closer to the walk with Christ. Be careful for nothing. Uh, I brought this up before. Luke 10, 41. And Jesus answered and said unto her, Martha, Martha, thou art careful and troubled about many things. Was Martha careful for nothing? <laughs> no. About many things. So, was Martha close to Jesus? Yes. yes. But, even with that closeness to Jesus, she put a wall up between them, and she was going to take all the troubles upon herself. And if we look at this verse, and we're looking through, the eyes of Martha, who is going to solve all of Martha's problems? Martha, right? It says, Martha, Martha, thou art careful, that's the same careful that's in 4.6 of Philippians, and troubled about many things. Martha is another person that, the, that Paul is giving lessons to, if you will, in Philippians, about the proper Christian mindset. What was Martha's mindset? She was worried, anxious, uh, uh, suspended in suspense about many things. She was troubled about many things. Did she cast her cares upon Jesus? No. What did she do? She kept those, she kept those burdens on her shoulders. And so we have an important example here. Uh, here's somebody that's close to Christ, knows Jesus Christ. I believe that we will see Martha in, in, in glory along with her sister and Lazarus, but she spent her life doing what? Battling within her mind and trying to solve all the problems. Uh, you know, what, what's that saying there? Uh, help me to, to change the things I can change and accept the things that I can't or, or whatever. That, that second part, help me to accept the things that I, I can. Those are the types of problems that, that we're talking about. And, and we got a verse here also. That we'll talk about that a little bit more. But Martha is 
the exact mindset of what we're trying to change here, okay? That Martha tried to solve her own problems, and by doing so, the result is she is careful and troubled about many things, okay? Do you think overall that Martha was a positive, happy person? No. I agree. Between Mary and Martha, who do you think would have been the easier person to be around all the time? Mary. Okay, so we could tell that God loved her, but we could tell that Mary was a down type of person, right? Always, always looking at the negative and stuff. And this is what Right? And, and, he, and Jesus gives us a great example of Mary and Martha. Mary understood the joy and the blessings of doing things with Christ. And Mary, on the other hand, felt the drudgery and the work and the responsibility of doing things for Christ. And we see that that drudgery troubled Mary, but we, uh, troubled Martha, but we see that Mary, nothing very negative is said about Mary at all through all that. Okay. Next verse, Matthew 6, 27. Which of you, by taking thought, can add one cubit unto his stature? Remember what we said, help me to accept the things I can't change? Can you change your height? No. No, okay. Can you worry about it? Yeah, it says right here, by taking thought. I'm short, or I'm too tall. Now for guys, it seems that guys go through life and they, they always wish that they were tall. Women, on the other hand, they don't want to be tall, right? You don't want to be taller than your boyfriend or your spouse, right? That, that's just not, you know, in, in their mind, that's not a perfect uh, 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 appearance for a couple or whatever. But in either scenario, can you go through life worried, uh, you, you can't go through life worried, oh my goodness, I am so much taller than my husband. How? How much of that are you going to be able to change? Nothing. Nothing. But you can go through a lot of mental energy worrying about it and having anxiety about it. Let's take the reverse of this couple. Say the wife is uh, six foot one and the husband is five six. Okay? And we kind of see that. The husband, on the other hand, Okay? Does he worry about that? He always has to look up with his look up to his wife all the time physically. Right? And he's shorter. Honey, can you come to the cabinet and reach the sugar for me? Okay? How does that go down? Alright? <clears throat> now, now that man. Can he go through life worrying about how short he is? Yes, he can. Is it going to add another six, seven inches to make him level out with his wife? No. He could worry about that for the 50 years they're married. It's never going to happen. So these are the things. So what Christ is trying to talk about here in the context of this is God will provide what you need. And we're, when we're talking about the Christian mindset, if we can get to the point here of be careful for nothing, and we get our minds to think that I can't change this, so I ask God just to help me to accept it. There's a lot of things in our lives we can't change, okay? You know, uh, you know, friends, relatives, 
they, they, they have these negative aspects to them, we would love to be able to change it for them, but we can't. But somebody can. It's God. So the Christian mindset Paul is trying to address here is th there's things that exist that we have no control over, but we could either be anxious and worried about it, or we could accept it and move on. And if you, if you have the ability to accept it and move on, what does that do to your mindset? It helps it. Okay? Once again, it goes on to that rejoicing. You think that that husband and wife rejoice when they walk into a wedding reception together, right? Or they walk into a restaurant together, okay? They don't want anybody to notice them because they're always worried about what that looks like. But, if, but other couples in that same situation, if they say, there's nothing we can do about it, we just love each other, we don't care what other people think. Who do you think is in the better mindset? Now, here's the other thing. What gets us into that negative mindset is, and, 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 and uh, the Gospels talk about it a lot, is we tend to worry what other people think. Okay? And if you're of that mindset that you tend to worry about what somebody or who some, what somebody thinks of you, then who is in control of your mindset? Are you or them? Now, for the most part, and I can speak for myself, for the most part, I really went through life, I really didn't care what other people think of me. I can't say 100%. I certainly cared what Teresa thought of me. So there are exemptions to that. But as a general rule, I, I never went through life trying to keep up with the Joneses or worried about what the neighbors think or this or that or whatever. And, and, and I, I feel that's helped me because I've seen people We've, uh, I, I have relatives that are extremely conscious of what somebody thinks of them. They have to live in, in a ritzy neighborhood. They have to drive ritzy cars. They, they, they have to show the appearance that they're super successful. And that's a burden to go through. And what Paul is trying to, to get across here, be careful for nothing. One of the things is, don't care what other people think of you. Who should you be caring about of who thinks of you? The Lord. What does the Lord think of you? If we can get our Christian mindset to that, that we can worry more about what Christ thinks of me, than what my neighbors think of me or my family thinks of me. Now, I told the story before when Teresa and I uh, got saved. Teresa got saved uh, about, about a year and a half before I did and stuff. But when I finally smartened up, I, I got saved. We went down to my parents to try to preach the gospel to them and ended up getting thrown out. But I could say, and yeah, did it upset me? It did. But as time passed, I really didn't care about what my parents thought of me being born again. Okay? And that's the proper mindset to be in. Okay? How, how many, uh, don't raise hands or whatever, but you can answer yourself. How many people, you know, didn't really want the family to know that I go to Bethel Baptist Church, you know, or you know that I'm saved or whatever. 
when I go to the family functions, I just kind of blend in. I, just, you know, I, I don't want to be known. That's because you think you, those people's opinions are more important than what Christ's opinions are. Yeah, right. So this is the mindset that Paul's trying to get at. Okay. Uh, John 14, 27. Peace I leave with you. My peace I give unto you. Not as the world giveth, give it I unto you. Let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. We'll see this verse again when we get to verse 7, when we start talking about the peace of God. But one of the things we'll talk about is where did the peace of God come from? My peace I give unto you. So, which brings up an excellent point. When you get saved, you receive a tremendous amount of gifts. When you say, when you accept Christ, it's like Christmas morning, right? You literally receive a ton of gifts. Undeserved, but you receive those tons of gifts. But in many aspects of Christ, your Christian faith, God will not intervene with you unless there's action on your part. On your part. And this is, this Christian mindset is something, does Christ give you the Christian mindset when you get saved? No. You have to what? You have to want it, and you have to learn it, and you have to activate it. Can, can you, like, like Martha, can Martha go through an entire life being saved and be negative and anxious and worried and troubled all the time? Yeah. And you'll notice that Jesus didn't fix Martha's problems. He pointed them out to her, right? Martha, Martha, right? You are careful and troubled about many things. Does, I don't have the verse up. Does the next verse say, but I'm going to take all your troubles and carefulness, your cares, and cast it upon me, and you're all set? No, it doesn't say anything like that. He left Martha in that state. It was Martha's responsibility to change that. And your mindset is your responsibility to change. God is not going to just, when you get saved, switch it and you're, you know, you're, you're walking down the streets uh, throwing up petals of flowers and whistling. And uh, No, it doesn't work that way. You have to want to do this, and you have to, to, to initiate the changes. God, with all those gifts that he's provided, gives you the tools to do it, but I've got a garage full of tools, but if I don't use them, what is their value? Right? Same thing with your Christian life. Right, you go to Galatians 5 and it tells you all the fruit of the Spirit. You've got it. Do you use it? Right? So. Uh, 13.5 again got in Hebrews. Let your conversation be without covetousness and be content with such things as ye have. There, there's a whole sermon right there. For he saith, I will never leave thee nor forsake thee. So that we may boldly say, the Lord is my helper, and I will not fear what man shall do unto me. There's that worry here. Paul, Paul's talking about in, in Hebrews, it says, the Lord is my helper. Right? He's leaning on Psalms. And it says, I will not fear what man shall do unto me. Christ talked about this in the Gospels. Fear who? Right? Fear who can not only kill you physically, but
but also throw you into hell. That's who you fear. Do you fear somebody that can kill you physically? No, not if you're saved. That's the mindset that we should be aspiring to. That we shouldn't, want, this is kind of a play on, don't worry about what other people think of you. If you're right in the sight of God, then it doesn't matter what else. Right? Do you think, do you think Christ was uh, in favorable sight of God during his ministry? Yeah. At the end of his ministry, the God was was God pleased with Christ? Yeah. Were men pleased with Christ? No. Who did who did Christ attain to? Worry to? He were, he wanted to make sure that he was right in the eyes of God. He could care less what other people thought. Humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God, that He may exalt you in due time. Humble yourselves. That goes against every fiber of a human being, is humbling themselves. Why? Because you have the pride of mankind in your flesh. Okay? But it says, casting all your care upon him. Why? For he careth for you. Most of us, if not, yeah, most of us were parents, our parents, okay? Did it break your heart when you saw your kids going through problems that you know in the end was going to turn out okay, but it still bothered you that they would have to go through some of these problems? Yeah. And you would give them counsel and you would tell them that it's going to be all right and, and all that, but did they believe you? Sometimes they would believe you, and yeah, so, and the, the smile would come, and you it would relieve them, and they're not, you know, they're not careful, or they're not anxious over that anymore. Other times was the, the, the phrase, I love this phrase, Dad, you don't understand. Okay? Anybody ever get that? Okay. Well, that's a Martha. This is my problem. I want to worry about it, and I want to beat myself up on it, and I don't want the help from it. When Jesus tries to comfort us through some problems, what do we tell him? What your kid told you. Dad, you don't understand. If you're continuing to struggle with the problem, what are you telling God? You don't understand. This is a problem. This is a bad problem. And you can't help. And that's not what this verse says. It says, casting all your care upon him, for he careth for you. He'll take care of the problem. The problem is going to resolve the way the problem is going to resolve. Right? Just like adding a cubit to your stature. Is that going to change going through all that work? No. And we'll wrap this up. Matthew 11, 28, 29. Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I am meek and lowly in heart, and ye shall find rest unto your soul. For my yoke is easy, and my burden is light. Let's go through this. Come unto me. Is that an action item? Yes. Jesus Christ is walking down the street. You have two options. You could go and meet him, or you can just walk by, right on by, right? It's an action you have to take. Come unto me. All. Who's the invitation to? All. Okay. That labor and are heavy laden 
just walking around with the troubles of the world upon you. His invitation is to all people that are troubled and heavy laden. And if you come on to him, what will he do? I will give you rest. Okay? I will give you rest. Will you have rest? If I gave you $500 and you didn't spend it, what good was that? Right? If, if God gives you something and you don't utilize it, what are you telling God? It's of no value to me. Okay? Take my yoke upon you. Take my yoke, Christ's yoke. Is that an action item? Yeah. You have the choice. I can either keep my yoke, and I love my yoke. It's got problems. It's got concerns, it's got burdens, it's got worries, it's got anxieties. Uh, it's, it's a good, heavy burden. I'm going to keep my yoke. Or I can do what? I can take his yoke. Okay? It's an action item. It's a choice. All right? Learn of me. And Take my yoke upon you and learn of me. Is that an action item? Do you know any Christians that got saved, even perhaps baptized, and 25 years later they're still an infant in Christ? I know some. It says, learn of me. It's an action you have to take. Just like renewing your mind or getting the Christian mindset it's an action you have to take and Christ is saying here learn of me does anybody here know everything there is to know about Jesus Christ no hopefully we learn something new about Christ well, hopefully every day but at a minimum, when, when we come and we assemble ourselves together, well, hopefully we're learning something. And it goes on. For I am meek and lowly at heart, and ye shall find rest unto your souls. Ye shall find rest unto your souls. If you do what? Right? If you come, take, and learn. Those are the action items. There's things that you have to do. And it goes on. It says, for my yoke is easy. Okay? You want it easy? What do you have to do? Take his yoke. Do you want it hard? What do you have to do? Keep your own. Okay? And my burden is light. You want to like burden or you want to keep your burdens. So we have the ability to be careful for nothing. Our anxiety, our worries, our troubles about what's going to happen tomorrow, if tomorrow even comes. There's no even guarantee for that. Or what we can do is learn about Christ, right? Take his yoke, it's easy and light, or we can keep ours. So if you're going through troubles and, and anxieties and problems, and you're just worrying yourself sick, take a step back and think, what can I do? Is there anything that won't, I don't care about changing the situation, is there anything that I can do 
that will change my outlook on the situation. And there is. There's action items. You go to Christ. And when we start finishing up verse 6, it talks about making your request known. Right? You come to God and you say, hey, I got this heavy burden. I got this heavy yoke. Okay? Can I have your yoke? And can I learn more about you? And you come, it gets into that previous verse about humbling yourselves. Who in here, when they need help, reaches out and asks somebody for help? I don't, for the most part. When I first moved into my house in Southington, I had a, a, a 12 by 12 shed, and it was in the wrong place of the property. So I jacked it up and I put it on some, uh, uh, I, I got a couple of long four by fours and I, and I greased it all up with dish soap, right? And I dragged that with my truck to another place and then lifted it up and then put the floor in underneath it. Do you think that I would ask a neighbor to help me? Right? I didn't. Why? Pride. I can do it myself. Right? How many of us are like that? If I got a problem, who's going to fix it? Me. Right? And what does that lead to? Right? It leads to pride, which leads to being affected by letting Satan have an open door into you and a very negative, worry, Christian life, filled with anxiety, getting back to be careful for nothing, okay? And as we go into this uh, next week here, we'll learn more about, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your request be made known unto man. Is there any action items in that verse? I won't point them out right now, but read that verse before I shut down. Is there any action items in that verse? Just like we have in that. Okay. All right, is there any questions? Concerns, complaints. Who's worried about something? <laughs> well, I want to just make a comment. Uh, I found that uh, people that be, can say, and, uh, and they run into problems, the first thing they, they do is stay out of church because they're worried about what everybody's thinking. Like exactly. Yeah. But uh, I've talked to people, uh, and I said, well, listen, they sh if, they're if everybody's thinking bad things about you, they should be ashamed because everybody's done something. And I says, the thing to do when you run into a problem is get back at church because faith comes from hearing, hearing the word of God. Amen. And, and it gets you stronger. Staying home and worrying about I, and I've told people that scripture, what do they do? They just stay home. <laughs> they don't take the scripture to hand because that gives you strength. And I, I've talked to people uh, like my nephews and certain people saying the same thing and uh, they don't, I said, stay, I said, stay, go back to church that's going to make you stronger. You can hear the word of God. What do they do? They stay home. So yeah. it's the only thing you can do. But that, that's that's from my, my personal experience too. Is uh, staying in the fellowship, hearing the word of God. You know. Great point. Dave, did you have your hand up? Yeah, it's called edification. Edification. Okay? You know, we're all, we're all everybody's coach. Right? You ever hear the term, coach them up? Okay? 
He got a marginal player, but I can coach him up that he can be pretty solid. Were you talking about something like that last week? Yeah. All right. Uh, okay, let's close in a word of prayer. Brother Ed, you want to close in a word of prayer? Father, thank you for the lessons that we've been learning about the Christian mindset. Help us to acclimate to that, Father, that might bring you honor and glory and be a blessing to you all around us. Pray that in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.